Uh, dear participants, good morning. Um, today I'll talk about my experience from uh, um, uh, funding a NGO. My book on leadership, I think you have picked up at the entrance. Read that book and you will make a jump in your career. If you, do, if you fail, you have to hand the book back to me. <laughs> now, um, during my 35 years of running big businesses with about a million people employed, I worked a lot in the developing world. I learned early on that practically all problems were caused by extreme poverty. The extreme poverty in turn was caused by at least 50% unemployment. At the same time, I obtained a deep insight into poverty when my companies beyond the factories and offices also invested in schools, small hospitals and living accommodations. As a donor, as a private donor like some of you, I want to share my experience from engaging in fighting extreme poverty over the past 18 years. As I mentioned, uh, typically unemployment, unemployment and underemployment is about 50% in many developing countries. First time I went to Afghanistan 12 years ago to launch a one million jobs program together with World Bank, President Bush the Younger with the US AID backing and um, Afghan President Hamid Karzai. I found that unemployment was not 50%, but 75%. And most of the other 25% who worked grew opium and fabricating heroin. My trigger for being fully time involved with charity work came year 2000. I was traveling in southern India. I had been to India maybe 80 times, and I was advising Rajiv Gandhi and other people in Delhi. So India was sort of a second home country for me, and I'm an honorary citizen of India nowadays. But in southern India, I saw children as young as 8, 12, who had been sold to the silk weaving mills. Blisters in their hands, red eyes from the silk dust, and this dry cough. <laughs> that you get from silicosis lungs, like the coal miners had in the old days in UK and other places. I reacted spontaneously and bought out the slave children for $100 per child, put them into school. However, the problem was that when I left the village, the child dropped out and the parents sold him or her again. So that became a fiasco. That's when I fully realized that I could not throw money at the problem, in this case, child labor. You had to lift the whole family out of extreme poverty so that parents could afford to send their children to school. When I turned 60, I had clocked up 120 years on the boards of big companies, half of them as chairman. But rather than spending the next 15 years on company boards, I decided to make an all-out effort to mobilize millions of poor people into entrepreneurship. During a few years, I phased out of my chairmanships so I could devote my time fully to charity. It was sort of an irony of destiny that I went from running some of the biggest companies in the world to some of the smallest. So we went through village after village, starting in India, and organized self-help groups, mainly for women, and then spreading from India to Indochina, Afghanistan, Southern Eastern Africa, Latin America. The women were the poorest of the poor, often illiterate and undernourished. They had low self-esteem and were downtrodden by their husbands and mothers-in-law. The self-help groups that were formed were an important and they had re solidarity in repayment of the microloans they got later. We taught them to read and write, simple economics like interest, mortgage rates, and so on. And when they had proven they could save, 
We help them with microloans. Many received vocational training like spinning, weaving, sewing, brick making, production of soap, toilet cleaning, chemicals, shampoo. Some got help to set up dairies where they produce yogurt and cheese, manufacturing of purses, paper cups, cutlery, hundreds of other things. And in service trade, they set up internet cafes, bicycle, motorcycle repair shops, beauty salons, etc. Hundreds of different types of businesses. And 80% of our coaching had to do with marketing, like packaging, pricing, contracts with big customers in uh, bigger cities, and export. To cut the long story short, we have now started, as uh, you mentioned, 2.3 million enterprises and trained 2.3 million entrepreneurs, 93% women. We are well underway towards our medium-term goal of 10 million new jobs. Since each job supports five family members on average, including babies and old people, that means 50 million people lifted out of poverty. The speed of job creation is accelerating. Currently, we are starting up a thousand enterprises every working day, or 100 per hour. When we started hand in hand, we had 25 people working in the field in southern India. Now there are 60,000 on all the continents, and it's an explosive growth. The living standard of the members of families are lifting from one dollar a day to three, four, five dollars a day and higher. These new enterprises are robust and sustainable. The repayment of microloans is 99.6%. So our women are very popular with the banks and microcredit institutions. After four years, 96% of the started companies are surviving, which is a uniquely high number for new companies. If you look at Silicon Valley or, you know, university, uh, academic parks and similar. Um, if we close hand in hand tomorrow, the millions of companies will continue to live on. They don't depend on us. Once they're up and running, that is true sustainability. However, we don't only really start new companies, but strive increasingly to support expansion. Today, 50% of all financing goes towards expansion of existing companies. We have today come up to 60,000 medium-sized enterprises. That means companies with 100, 200, 300 people. As an example, a lady I met some eight years ago, she had two employees, her husband and an outsider, and they made Jute bags where you printed the name of the shop so the customers could buy, uh, bring home the goods in that bag instead of plastic. Three years later, she had 60 people employed, and she had through financing bought uh, printing machines, duh, 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 like that, you know, and now she's on her way to 300 employees. When you buy books in London, Paris, and other places, you get them in her Jute bags. That's the way you lift standards in families, in whole villages, in whole districts. Compared to with the traditional giving we have been doing for 100 years in the charity world, the impact on poverty reduction per dollar is 25 times bigger if you go the way with entrepreneurship. You take your destiny in your own hands. You take your own responsibility. You're not a client waiting for a handout. You have heard the old expression, give a poor man a... Um, um, uh, not fish, but the um, uh, equipment to buy fishing rod, <laughs> fishing rod, yeah, to, to get fish. Now, the past 15 years, this way of approaching poverty has gained ground, and we are leading the way. We are working with other NGOs like Oxfam, CARE, many others, and I don't care. Uh, how we spread our experience. 
You start like when I ran Sandvik or ABB, then you're protected, you know how, you have patents and that type of thing. Here, we don't care. It's just a matter of spreading it as much as possible. Sometimes I get the question, why women dominate as entrepreneurs? And why I don't give microcredits to, women, to men? The answer is simple. Many men drink, gamble, they're often lazy and do not take responsibility. It is as usual. <laughs> Normally I get an applause from the women when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> when a man makes a profit, uh, he drinks it very often. A woman, the profit goes to the children. Now this is nothing new. Women has for thousands of years in these villages made 80% of the work. Sometimes we get ten tension between the sexes, when the women are the bosses and the men are the employees. I remember a case when a woman got a microloan of $150 to buy an electric sewing machine. The husband, who used to be, of course, a physically stronger guy in the household, he took the money and was, of course, going to drink it up. But when the woman could not sew and repay the loan, she was in trouble. And other colleagues in that group also have to pay for her because they have solidarity in payment. So um, they become, became, of course, angry. And the man was confronted with 16 women in a rage. To meet one woman in a rage can be difficult. What do you think about 16? What do you think? <laughs> Troublesome, yeah. <laughs> what did he do? He gave back the money. That's what we call hands-on solidarity, hand-in-hand -hand style. It's important for these women to support each other. They've been downtrodden by husbands, mothers-in-law, and here they have, so to say, a new environment with sort of sisters who can back them up. It's also important to make this at a low cost. We are down to cost as low as $10, $15 for a job. The main cost is salaries to our trainers. How can it be so inexpensive? My old friend Kofi Annan, who lived here in Geneva for a while, he died, as you know, recently. He said, no NGO in the world is in the neighborhood of you when it comes to low cost, speed, and big scale. How can it be so low cost? We don't send out expensive Westerners. We use local people. College-educated Indian costs 10% of a Swede, Swiss, or American. So um, the Indians help out in Asia, Kenya, Eastern Africa, South Africa helps Southern Africa, etc. The money goes north-south, but the work goes south-south. Secondly, we have 50,000 volunteers. How much do they make? Zero. Um, and then I brought with me my best practice from the business world with uh, quantified targets, high ambition, transparency, cost consciousness, rewarding good performers, weeding out poor performers. Some people said at the beginning that I was not a suitable man to hand this up. I was a capitalist, and I could not understand these poor, sick people, but they were wrong. Finally, I hate big headquarters. When I ran ABB some 20 years ago, we were 220,000 people, and I had a headquarter in Erlikon over here at Zurich, never more than 100 people. IBM had 4,000 people in their headquarter. Philips had 3,000. I don't like headquarters. Keep them down to the absolute minimum. And that means that if we get $100,000, $100,000 goes down, not 90, 80, or 70. So far, I've talked about enterprise, job creation, to lift people quickly, expensively, out of extreme poverty. That's fundamental for our other half of activities. If you're hungry or live close to starvation, you only think about one thing, food. 
Bertolt Brecht, the German dramatist, he said, Erst kom das Fressen, dann kom, kommt die Moral. Or something like that. My German is not perfect, but I think some of you speak German and understand it. And he's absolutely right. Food is everything if you're hungry. Now, um, this uh, job creation, enterprise creation, is like an icebreaker to bring people up. Uh, now, uh, once they're up, you can interest them for putting children to school and give them a future. 350,000 children, and we add about 50,000 children every year presently into our 600 schools. We run mobile medical camps in poor areas of Africa and India where they've never seen a doctor. We pick up malaria, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS, leprosy, and we also have eye camps and similar things. We have a barefoot doctor program where we teach uh, these women to make a bandage, simple hygienic rules, like washing your hands before eating and that type of thing. The toilet program is important. You need millions of toilets so people don't sit out on the ground and, and they're, they defecate and it goes down in the groundwater and you get uh, water carried illnesses like uh, cholera. Particularly the women are badly off because most trees are cut down and then you have to sit in, in the open so they have to contain themselves the whole day and only go out when it is dark and then they get all types of women diseases. We also run programs against domestic violence, drug, alcoholic abuse. Most important is birth control programs. Today, we, doesn't, we don't talk so much about birth control, but that is key. Think about Africa. They will have another billion people in 30 years. And where are that billion coming? In the driest, poorest areas who can't even support themselves today. Think then about the Mediterranean and all this trouble when they try to escape into Europe. In our Indian villages, we have gone from four or five children per family to two. And we have succeeded to stop the terrible habit of aborting or outright killing girls, which has been you know, a, a tradition in large parts of India. We have a network of citizen centers where people living on the fringes learn about citizen rights, register for voting, they learn computers, we have in India 23 million people involved in such programs. Further, we have environment projects. I mentioned earlier clean water, but we also um, dig dams to collect the ban abundant monsoon rains. Today we have 30,000 hectares converted from barren desert areas to having two, three harvests per year. Another environmental project is collecting, sorting, recycling of waste. The plastic thrown everywhere is terrible. The cows eat plastic, get sick and die. And it takes 500 years for a plastic thing to disintegrate in nature. So we have crushing machines for pet bottles, you know, that we got from Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola. We have shredding machines for plastic bags and send the plastic pallets back to the uh, plastic industry. Tetra Pak, that you may know here in Switzerland, um, we make board out of the empty cartoons with juice and milk and other things. So there are many things you can do. Household waste becomes compost with the help of earthworms. They eat one and a half times their weight every day. And, com uh, and waste comes into one end of the worm and compost comes out on the other one. I love these workers. No strikes, no bad Monday mornings. <laughs> they work seven days a week. I usually take them in my hands and caress them when I'm there. <laughs> Lena, when you went with me, that is, by the way, Lena sitting there. Stand up. She is a colleague of mine <laughs> who is here. <laughs> 
she doesn't like to, like the worms, but I like them. Now, we also make methane gas from the household waste and lead it into the villages where they use it for cooking instead of open fires. If you travel in Africa and Asia, a clear day like today, then you have a yellow haze in the sky all the time from hundreds of millions of open fires. That means to cut down the trees and these open fires are quite polluting. Well, these examples illustrate what can be achieved once you get living standard up. But we are mostly known for creating enterprises and jobs, and we branch out to more and more countries and states in India. When I came, for example, to Rwanda, the president there asked me for 200,000 jobs. Uh, Kagari, you call him a dictator, I think he's a good guy, and he's not uh, very, very, um, not into uh, corruption either, which is uh, very good. But there I went linked up with Oxfam and CARE, and they had people working there, and I brought Kenyans in there, so they trained the trainers to start enterprises and jobs. And after four years now, we have got 200,000 jobs in Rwanda, a country that, you know, was quite badly uh, uh, dealt with here some years ago with the civil war. We get 20% of our funding from um, institutions like World Bank, Brussels, national agencies like uh, British DFID, American USAID, Swedish SIDA. And these uh, institutions are good because they make due diligence and reassure the private sector that we are serious and we are very, very reliable. 80% of the funding comes from the private sector, entrepreneurs like you, foundations, companies. They like our philosophy with help to self-help, that poor people lift themselves out of poverty. They like zero corruption. They like practically zero overhead in the West. They like transparency. So that's the way we don't need so much money. We run it on a shoestring, as Americans say. But we need some to, to uh, give salaries to our teachers and so on. Then we have lower level people like um, uh, hotels, uh, restaurants, uh, architect firms and so on, who adopt a village for two years, $50,000, maybe 1,500 people live there, 200 jobs, child labor eliminated, computer training, toilet construction, compost production, and they get a report all the time. Also families, I have seven grandchildren, each has got such a, uh, such a village. Um, and um, I even got the greedy lawyers to support me, which has not been so easy. I namely don't like lawyers. I hate lawyers. They've been chasing me for 40 years in America, the litigation lawyers. I was chased for side effects of AstraZeneca medicine. I was chased for old Chevrolets at General Motors. <laughs> they always went for the chairman <laughs> to sue him. So uh, we were quite upset about those people. Finally, we decided in America to do something about it. Uh, you know, when you launch a new medicine, you have to try it out on living uh, people or animals or whatever, so you can be sure that it's good for people. So we decided to replace rats with lawyers. <laughs> I hope there are not too many lawyers in the room. What was the advantage? There are more of them. More lawyers than rats. S secondly, no risk that the experimental personnel got emotionally engaged with animals. No problem with that. But I had one problem, and that was that uh, you could not be sure that the results were transferable to human beings. <laughs> <laughs> I had a meeting with 700 lawyers in Scandinavia. I hesitated to go there because I thought they were my enemies. Um, and I started the morning by saying, 
dear lawyers, good morning. And then I added, that's the nicest thing I will say to you today. <laughs> you heard a mumbling there, you know. But we got, as a matter of fact, uh, some five million dollars at the time, you know. So maybe lawyers are not so bad in the end. Well, this illustrates a little how we operate, what we do, uh, enterprises, jobs, how we then steer people with a higher living standard into these other areas I mentioned. And if you uh, donate $100,000, you lift 25,000 people out of poverty. And 500 working children to school, and all these other programs I mentioned regarding environment and, and so on. This is uh, my story about my experience. I mean, I look forward, it's going to be more of the same. We are just expanding along the same lines. Hand in hand is my biggest project, bigger than all the big companies I've been running. It's my most important project and my last project. Thank you for the attention. <laughs>